But it's good to be here. I want to greet all of you there at Baker Campus, Livingston, Warehouse, Mid-City, soon to be Homa. Come on, we're, we're spreading out and large in our territory. Amen. And uh, it's good to be with you today. It has been six months since I've preached a weekend service. So we might be here all day because I got a lot to say. But uh, I preached last night and this morning and uh, I'm feeling good. God is bringing me through. I've been through a lot of battles. But one thing I learned is they always come to an end. And they, even when they don't seem like they're going to end, they're going to end. And the sun is going to come out at some point. And God's favor, you know, weeping may go on all night, but joy comes in the morning. And uh, I've definitely lived that and seen that and can testify to that. I don't know if you're going through something right now you think it's never going to end. It is going to end. And something good is on its way. Amen. Uh, I'm very honored to be with you this weekend on Freedom Weekend. In fact, that's what I want to talk to you about, the subject of finding freedom, because freedom is something that we're always pursuing. It's never a destination. It's a process. And a lot of times we think of freedom as the absence of tyranny. But I believe real freedom is when we take hold of every opportunity that God has given us in our life whether it be in our calling, whether it be financially, whether it be in our health, whether it be in our relationships, we're always needing that freedom that God has promised us, but we've got to lay hold of it. So that's what I want to talk about as we're in this July 4th season and celebrating Independence Day. I, I want to talk to us today about finding freedom. Amen? Yeah. Now, as I was just praying about this weekend, uh, there's so many different passages that we're reading every day in the one-year Bible, and one passage in particular just, just jumped up in my spirit, and as I began to read over it, it said exactly what I wanted to communicate to you today, and that's from 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And for those of you who are familiar with the prayer of Jabez, this is from the prayer of Jabez, and I'm going to read verse 9 and 10, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to jump off into this. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. I want you to take note of that. He was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. Now, the next little phrase is very important. And God granted him his request. I'm going to say that again. And God granted him his request. That's a very important line right there. In fact, I think we need to say it one more time. And God granted him his request. Boy, that's an important aspect right there of prayer is that it's answered. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you today for this time together. I thank you for every person who's watching at the different campuses, who's watching online. I thank you for those right here in this auditorium that your anointing would be with each and every one of us. I thank you, Lord, that faith is being built today, that we can find freedom and become all that you have created us to be. For you made us more than conquerors. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We were destined for the great greater things that you have for us. And so today, Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you are giving us clarity. You're encouraging us. Your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's cutting away any misunderstandings or any false ideas, and it's bringing with it healing, truth, light, and illumination. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Finding freedom. Now, you know, I'm going to give you four keys today that I believe are going to help you. And I, I couldn't help as I was getting this sermon ready to think about dad and how dad loves keys. And he loves to give keys. And on Lifeline, he used to talk about the key to this and the key to that. And one day we were in the store and a little boy was with his mom and he hit his mom. And he said, hey, mama, there's the key man. And so I've got four keys today in true Pastor Larry fashion that I want to give you on how to find freedom. And we go back to this prayer of Jabez. Jabez was more honorable 
than his brothers. That man, he was doing everything right, but he still wasn't seeing what he wanted to see. And I don't know if I'm talking to anybody in here today where you feel like you're doing things right, but yet you're not seeing what you want to see. And a lot of times, maybe, you know, the gospel's being preached today that get saved and everything's going to go great for you. And that's not the gospel. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but fear not for I have overcome the world. And so a lot of times there's kind of a, a false expectation of when we get saved, everything's just going to line up, the sun's going to come out, and everything's going to be great. But really it's the opposite. When we get saved, the devil really starts to attack us. And it's funny because we're going to be referring to Joseph throughout this message. We're going to kind of parallel him with Jabez. Joseph was the only brother who came under attack. None of the other brothers had any problems except Joseph. Now, they, they made all kind of dumb decisions and messed their own lives up, but none of them were under attack but Joseph. None of them got thrown into a pit. None of them got sold as a slave. None of them had a false accusation. None of them lived in a dungeon. But here's the thing. None of them ever were in a palace either. And so whenever you get saved, you begin the journey towards the destiny of God on your life to impact the earth through the kingdom of God. And Jabez was in that same place. He was more honorable than his brothers, but he wasn't seeing what he wanted to see. I've been in that place before. I thought, Lord, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do, but I'm just not seeing what I'm supposed to see. And I think we all get there, whether we realize it or not, we have that feeling in us and it begins to breed frustration. And a lot of times we get upset with God, like, God, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. But today we're going we're gonna to pull some things out of this that I believe are going to help you and maybe eliminate some of that frustration. And, and the first thing we see, Jabez came to the Lord and he said, oh, that you would bless me. Oh, that you would bless me. Now, this, this, wasn't a, this wasn't a Lord, if you get around to it, think about your servant Jabez. My birth was painful and my life is painful. If you so have it in your heart and you can somehow, some way, bless me. No, he said, oh, anything, when somebody's crying out, they say, oh, he started this prayer with a, oh, that you would bless me. In other words, there was a passion in his voice. He said, oh, that you would bless me. You know, has anybody in here ever been at, uh, at a time where you just cried out, oh? Maybe you're laying in the bed and something's going on and, or maybe it, it, something's happening in your life and you just get to a point of frustration. You just shout out. I think that's where Jabez was. He was just frustrated. He just said, oh, God. I need you to bless me. There was a hunger in his heart. He began to cry out. And, and that's what I want to give you that first word in the blank there is devotion. Because devotion is the way to daily pursue the blessing. That's what it is. Devotion is daily pursuing the blessing. And, and it's like, it's not because we're after something. It's because we're after God. And we're saying, God, I need to know that you're with me because the, the blessing is a spiritual thing. It doesn't come from man. You can't go to Walmart and buy a six pack of the blessing. You, you can't go down to the bank and borrow the blessing. You have to, you have to pursue the blessing you have to say, Lord, I'm after the blessing. I, I love when Jacob was wrestling with that angel and it got to the morning time and the angel said let me go and Jacob said that okay I'll let you go but first you got to bless me he didn't say give me a pot of gold he, he didn't say ensure I'm going to be a king he didn't say any of that he said I got to know one thing and I'm not letting go of you until you bless me it, it was the same that that's the same tenacity the woman with the issue of blood had when she crawled through that crowd through the dirt, and she grabbed a hold of him and his garment. She didn't know what she was going to get. She just knew that there was something that was going to bless her that was going to come from Jesus. Devotion says, every day, I'm going to pursue the blessing. 
I'm going to get in the Word. I'm going to find out what's mine in Christ Jesus. I'm going to see the promises of God. I'm going to see by His stripes I am healed. I'm going to see, behold, I've given unto you the power to get wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18. And, and you know what? If you don't read Deuteronomy, you don't see that. And faith doesn't come. And you don't pursue that blessing. And every day, devotion is how we practically pursue the blessing. Now, this year, we've been reading the one-year Bible. Many of you know that. And some of you may have started strong, and maybe you've trailed off a little bit and got discouraged. I want to encourage you. This is the halfway point. Get back in the game. The coach may have benched you in the first half for a couple of bad plays, but it's the second half. Get back in the game and make a play. Hallelujah. Maybe you've been reading all year and you're going along. Hey, keep going for it. But you know what? We need to get back into devotion. We need to get back. It starts with the word and then prayer and worship and anything. You need to be riding down the road, turn off tear in my beer and get on some worship music. Turn off Wink and turn on Deluge. Come on. And get some worship going and, and make everybody on the road think you're crazy because you lifting your hands. I love that song. I lift my hands in the sanctuary. My wife says, I only lift one and keep one on the wheel. Because I get up in the car going and. Devotion. Devotion. It's how we pursue the blessing. Now, the second thing he said is expand my territory. Expand my territory. And what is this? This is growth. This is growth. God wants you to grow. You've got to expand yourself internally so that God can expand you externally. If you don't grow on the inside, God can't grow you on the outside. And you can sit around and wait on God to do this and that forever. And nothing happened because you haven't equipped yourself. I want you to remember the story of the widow. And she came to Elisha and she said, they're going to take my sons, the creditors. And he said, go and borrow as many vessels as you can. Close the door and begin to pour the oil. And you know what? She poured that oil until she ran out of vessels. And when she ran out of vessels, the oil stopped pouring. You know why? Because God isn't going to waste his blessing. I'm going to say that again. God is not going to waste his blessing. When she ran out of vessels, she ran out of oil. And, and so many times, we want the oil to flow before we get the vessels. When I see the oil flow, then I'll get the vessels. Now, I want to put up Isaiah 54, verse 2 and 3. It's, a, it's something that the Lord's really been challenging me with lately. I want to share with you. It says, enlarge your house, build an addition, spread out your home, and spare no expense. In verse 3, for you will soon, somebody say soon, you will soon be bursting at the seams. Now, it would be better for us if verse 3 was verse 2 and verse 2 was verse 3. We want the soon to come, and then we begin the enlargement. We want the soon to come, and then we'll build an addition. We want the soon to come, and then we'll spare no expense. But no, verse 2 is all about what you're going to do, and verse 3 is about what God's going to do in response to what you did. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, if you believe you've received it, you'll have it. It's like, no, wait, 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 wait. I'll receive it and then I'll believe it. No, that's not faith and it doesn't please God. You got to believe you received it and then you'll have it. You got to build an addition and then you'll have the goods to fill the addition. You got to enlarge your house and then God will fill your house. Come on, somebody's going to get it today. So it's up to you to grow and then it's up to God to show up and fill up the vessel. He's well able to fill up the vessel, but he can't fill up a limited vessel. God's got an unlimited supply, but if you give him a thimble, he's just going to give you a drop. So we, we got to do our part. We got to begin to grow. We got to begin to expand. We got to begin to prepare for what God wants to do in our lives. Now, uh, that verse 3 says, for soon you'll be bursting at the scene. And I don't know about you, but... But sometimes I get wondering if God's soon is a little bit different than my soon. 
And I start thinking, well, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, so soon the God could be a hundred years, and I won't even be here when soon shows up. <laughs> you know, you can't sit around in your shack waiting on Mr. Soon to show up. Start building an addition on that thing. Get out a nail and some hammers and start growing that thing. And God will show up when you have prepared a place for him. The Bible says when Moses finished assembling the tabernacle, put everything in place, put the blood on the altar, spread the oil on everything. When he got everything in place, guess what happened? The cloud showed up. When Solomon filled the temple, finished the temple, and got everything ready, guess what happened? The cloud showed up. But see, we want the cloud to show up, and then we'll start building. God says, no, I, I don't do things that way. You expand, then I'll expand you. What, and what, what's some practical ways we do that? Obviously, we talked about the word devotion, but I'm talking now more about educating yourself, equipping yourself, preparing yourself. You know, we all want promotion, but we don't want to prepare for promotion. We all want God to bless us, but we don't prepare for blessing. We've got to know how to steward what he's going to give us before he gives it to us. That's why a lot of the body of Christ is not seeing the blessing of God that they want to see because they haven't equipped themselves with how to steward the blessing that God wants to give you. And so we got to get this down. In. I've got to grow. What have I got to do? I've got to turn off the television. I've got to quit entertaining myself and start educating myself. Because education will prepare you. Entertainment will hold you back. So let's, let's, let's turn off that sitcom with fake laughs anyway. <laughs> and let's, let's, let's open up a book. Let's listen to a podcast. Let's watch an inspirational video. Let's do something to equip ourselves. Let's take a course online. Let's enroll in a new class. Let's do something to equip ourselves for what God wants to do next. I don't care if you're 15 or 85. If you're still sucking air on this planet, there's a next for you. And God wants to equip you for it because he's doing something in your life. We got to grow. We were made to grow. Now, I want them to put up a little chart for me that I believe makes a powerful point for us. And in this chart, you're going to see four things that and then there's a line and then there's two more things. And this is called the six basic needs of humanity. The first one is certainty. Certainty. What is certainty? It means you got to know that you got something to eat coming up. It means you got to know you got a roof over your head. It means you got to know you got clothes to wear. We all want certainty. But here's the thing. If it gets too certain, we get bored and don't want to live anymore. So we need a little bit of uncertainty to balance it out. We need adventure. We need fun. We need humor. Humor is the unexpected. And we, we all crave that. We all love laughter. We all love joy. It, it, it's the uncertain things that bring joy to our life. It's the certain things that bring security to our life. Yeah. Got to have that. And then what's that? We got to have significance. Everybody wants to feel like they matter. Everybody wants to feel like if, if, if they weren't here tomorrow, somebody would be upset and somebody needs them and somebody wants them to be around and and. You know, it's, it's no fun if you can go a whole week and not one person calls you. No, you, you, you want to know that somebody out there is thinking about you. You know, I'm, I'm in contact with a lot of pastors and constantly encouraging leaders. And, but this week I got a text from a friend of mine in Arkansas who just sent me a text and just said, I'm just thinking about you today. I sure love you. And I just believe in the call of God on your life. And you know what? Man, that just. And what was that? It just made me feel significant. It said, hey, that guy is busy. He's over there in Arkansas. But you know what? He's thinking about me. And he took time to just encourage me for a moment. We need that significant. And, and then not just that. We need love. We need connection and love. We need family. We need, we need people in our lives who, who love us. 
Not just significance, but love, connection, love. That's why you need to be in a, a small group of people who you're connected with. And, and they can encourage you when you're down. And they can tell you that what you're thinking is straight up dumb when you think about leaving your spouse. You need that. We need connection. But, but the funny thing about these four first things is, is we all innately pursue them no matter what. Something in us. It doesn't matter if we do it right or wrong. People find love in all the wrong places. They, why do people join gangs? Because they want to be significant. They find certainty, uncertainty. We find those things. It's like breathing. It's like your heart beating. It's like all that. It just happens. You don't even have to think about it. You're going to pursue it, whether in a right or a wrong way. But the last two, you need just as much as those first four. The only thing is they're voluntary. So you can, you, you can have the first four things and, and be rocking along and, and Everything kind of be okay, but you never really get where you want to be. You never really meet your financial goal. You never really feel fulfilled in your relationship. You never really feel like you're walking in the call of God on your life that, that you should be because there's two more things, and they're voluntary. It's growth. Every one of us has a need to grow, and it's generosity. Now, we're talking about growth today. Generosity could be something as simple as serve 225. Say, I'm going to give one day to go out and do something for someone else. And when we get done, we're going to be tired. We're going to be sweaty. But we're going to feel real good. Why? Because we fulfilled a basic need, and that is to be generous to other people. If all you do is just think about you and your needs and your problems and talk about you and yourself... You know what? You're never going to find the true fulfillment that God has for you because you were created to be generous. And what we're talking about today, you were created to grow. You were not meant to be stagnant. You say, well, I, you know, I got a degree in this and that was in 1972. Well, guess what? It's time to grow again. It's time to breathe new life into yourself. It's time to begin to, to say, you know what? I need to expand on the inside. I need to make more of who I am by pursuing growth because anything that God blesses begins to grow. He blessed man and he said, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion over the earth. God never created anything that wasn't meant to grow. He never did. Everything is meant to grow. Life is meant to grow. There's no such thing as a person that's born as an adult and then becomes a baby. I know Hollywood tried to make it so, but it ain't so. <laughs> Babies are born about that big and then they get about this big. Because growth is healthy. Growth is life. And you were made to grow. Now, the next thing we got to find in freedom is favor. Favor. Now, what is favor? Favor is not luck. It follows obedience. You can put that in the blank there. Favor is not luck. It follows obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to the Word of God. That's why you need devotion, because you need to know God's blueprint from the Word of God. You won't know it if you don't study it every day. What else? You need to be growing. Favor follows growth. You need to be sharpening your relational skills. Your understanding of stewardship, your understanding of the marketplace. We, you know, I believe that those of us who are in the church ought to be the sharpest people out there when it comes to un the understanding of the times. Why is it, and it's got to be the devil, that the church wants to always put their head in the sand like an ostrich and wait on the rapture? Really? Forget about the rapture. The rapture's going to come when the rapture's going to come. And people, well, are you pre-trib, mid-trib? I don't know. I just know one day I'm out of here, and until then, I'm going to work with all of my might. I'm going to do, do whatever I can to impact the world around me for the kingdom of God. I'm not going to worry about the rapture. God's got all that figured out. And listen, when it happens, it's going to happen, and there's not going to be anything you can do to change whether you're ready or not. In the blink of an eye, we're going to be up. I remember my grandmother, 
my mommy, dad's mom had a, had a vivid vision, a night vision in a dream where she was taken up in the rapture and she looked out. She was about two miles above the earth and she saw all these other saints that were just going up into the heavens. And she thought, my God, the rapture has happened. And she was just rejoicing. And then she woke up. <laughs> and Papa was snoring. <laughs> the rapture had not happened. Have you ever had one of those moments where you got home and nobody was there and you thought, oh, God, the rapture's happened. <laughs> I always immediately looked for my mother because I knew if I could find Mama, the rapture had not happened. Now, the person I knew was ready was my mama. And if she ain't going up, I know I ain't going up. <laughs> Favor follows obedience. Obedience. You know, at some point for you to find the freedom that God has for you, you're going to need at least one moment of God's favor. You're going to need somebody to do something for you that they didn't have to do. In fact, you're going to need somebody to do something for you. They don't even understand why they did it after they did it. You're going to need, you, you're going to need something to happen that should not have happened for you, but it did because of the favor of God. Yeah. Amen. Now, we can preach on favor, and I, I love favor, but here's the deal. Devotion and growth come before the favor. Because if you don't ever prepare yourself, God is never going to open the door. If you're, not, if you're not faithful to be prepared for the position, God can't give you the promotion. So the favor of God is something we have to have. And, and that's, we're all looking for that. We're all waiting on that. When we talked a minute ago about Mr. Soon showing up, we're talking about the favor of God. Jo Joseph was just doing what he could do. He did it as his dad's son. He did it in Potiphar's house. He did it in the dungeon. But then God did something that he could have never done. His gifts brought him to the right hand of Potiphar, but only God's favor could bring him to the right hand of Pharaoh. Oh, come on, somebody. I said his gift could bring him to the right hand of Potiphar, but only God's favor could put him at the right hand of Pharaoh. And maybe you've been, maybe you've been working in Potiphar's house and you've been doing good and, and things are going okay, but something in your heart says there's something more. Well, guess what? You're never going to get to more without favor. And you're never going to get to favor without obedience. And you'll never even know what to obey if you're not equipping yourself. This is, this, this is how we find freedom. It's a process. It's a journey. It's not a, it's not a miracle. It's something that we have to pursue. And that's where we come to our last word. And that is process. Process. You know, at the beginning of our time, I mentioned that it's been six months since I've preached. I believe that's the longest amount of time that I've gone without preaching in 20 years. And at the end of last year, I ministered here the last Sunday of December, and I was experiencing, I've been in three years of just phenomenal supernatural health, and I give God all the glory for it. And, and I was, yes, that's right. And uh, I've traveled all over this country. Uh, in 2015, I did uh, close to 50 weekends out of the year. I was in a different city. And that takes supernatural health. I'm just tell you that right now. Uh, people who are on dialysis are not supposed to be able to do that. But uh, as I was going into this year, I was seeking the Lord. And I said, Lord, what, what's my theme for this year? Give me a, give me a mantra. Give me a, something I can say and inspirational all year to keep me focused. And I, I just had this phrase, work the process, work the process. I thought, oh, all right, praise God. I'm going to work the process. And so January, I started work the process and all month long, everything's great. But then I got to February and things went downhill quick. And I started having some trouble with my heart and then I ended up in the hospital and then I started having procedures and then I had five procedures in six weeks. 
And by the time I got done with all five of those operations, I, I couldn't even walk. And I went from being strong and exercising, walking two miles a day and, and doing whatever I wanted to do to I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even think about preaching. I was just glad if I could get up and walk in the kitchen and get a banana. And I said, you know what? Now I know why the Lord gave me work the process. Because I got two choices. One, I can just sit around and languish in this circumstance because the circumstance is real. You know, the storm, Peter looked around. There was a real storm going on. There was real wind and wave. He, that wasn't a figment of his imagination. Those circumstances you're coming up against, they're real. They're very real. But you can either focus on them and sink and get lower and lower and lower, or you can say, I'm going to work the process. And my process, every day I like to get up, read my Bible, read a couple of different excerpts from different books that I'm currently reading, watch an inspirational video. I like to spend about one hour doing my process. And you know what? When I was feeling great, I was working my process. When I started feeling terrible, there was only one thing I could do every day if it was laying in the bed, and that was work the process. So high or low, the process is what brings you through. See, I believe Joseph did the same thing in the dungeon as he did in the palace. And I believe he did the same thing in his father's house as he did in Potiphar's house. It didn't matter where he was. He worked the process because the process is the only thing you have control over. See, I, I'm one of these people. I like control. I control anything. I want to control everything. But I've learned in my life that the most important things I can't control. Come on, somebody. And I can't control when I'm going to feel good, when I'm going to feel bad. What I can control is how I respond when I'm high and when I'm low. That's right. Because God is in charge of the destination. We're in charge of the journey. Uh-oh, come on, somebody. God's in charge. He'll decide the destination. But we've got to walk out the journey. It's a journey of faith. It's an adventure. You know, God is a God of adventure. And an adventure is not an adventure until something goes wrong. Oh, we don't like that. We want a fantasy. A fantasy is where everything goes right. No, this faith walk is not a fantasy. It's, it's an adventure. So this process. Now, you know, I got thinking, I, I'm one of these people, I like things now. You know, order it in the back, pick it up on the side, and you better have it in 30 seconds or I'm mad and calling the number. <laughs> no, it's just joking. That, that, that's, we've been trained to be that way in our society. But see, God doesn't work that way. And I, I learned something in buying houses that you, the bigger the purchase, the longer it takes. You know, you can close on a pack of bubble gum at Chevron in about 20 seconds. But it's going to take 60 to 90 days to close on a $300,000 house. Why? Because the bigger it is, the longer the process. See, Psalm 105, verse 17 says, until the time came to fulfill his word, God tested Joseph's character. And so if you want a palace destiny, you got to be willing to go through a 12-year process. And this is something that we resist. We don't like that process. I hated every, my house in Dallas, I hated every minute of closing on that thing. I mean, they were calling me every other day wanting to know my shoe size and my favorite color and <laughs> what kind of bubble gum I like to chew. And I, I mean, it's unbelievable. And I was miserable. But when I moved in and it was over, I loved every minute of that. Why? Because the more the pain, the greater the gain. And Joseph had to endure the dungeon in order to be elevated to the palace. And we don't like that process. Paul said it's like a woman in labor. Great pain gives way to great joy. When a new child is born, when that mother holds that child, she says it was worth it. It was all worth it. And that's what the process is. You know, I heard something years ago 
uh, from a sports commentator that said, the difference between a Hall of Fame quarterback and a good quarterback is the Hall of Famer loves the process. The good quarterback loves the game. The Hall of Fame quarterback is all about Monday through Saturday preparing, practicing, lifting weights, doing therapy, studying film, getting there early, leaving late. They learn to love it, and because they love the process, they excel in the game. But the mediocre players, they just love the 100,000 fans and the TV cameras and the touchdown dance. And that's, we can get in that mode where all we, we just want the good times, the high time, the adoration, the hand clap, the celebration, and, and anything other than that. We, we don't like it and we complain and we grumble and we get frustrated. But, but God is trying to teach us to embrace the process and actually fall in love with the process because the difference between closing on a house and God's process is, is you've never seen the house before. That's why it takes faith. God says, hey, you just go through this process. I'll work on the outcome. I'll take care of the destination if you take care of the journey. I believe every one of us has got to find the process that God has for us. We've got to know every day what is our process. Because our process is what's making the decision to put one foot in front of the other. When I preach on hope, I talk about that long tunnel. And if you lay down, it becomes a grave. But if you start walking, it becomes a tunnel. And at the end is the sunlight of God's grace, his mercy, his favor, his exceeding abundant above all we could ask or think. But if you stop and give up your daily process, you stop moving. And it becomes a tomb, becomes a graveyard. I believe that there is an anointing here at every campus online right now of faith for people to step up and say, you know what? I want to find freedom. I want to find my process. I want to work my process. I want to surrender to the process. I, want, I know there's more in my calling. I know there's more in my relationships. I know there's more for me in every area of my life. And, and I just believe faith is here today for people to reach out and begin to lay a hold of it one day at a time. If that's you and you want prayer for that, just that faith and that anointing to come on you that I brought with me this weekend, I want you to just stand up right there where you are. Something's resonating in your heart. Just stand up and I want you to lift your hand wherever you are. Baker, Livingston, Mid-City, Warehouse. I want you to just lift your hands to the Lord. If you're watching online right now, just lift your hands to the Lord as a sign of surrender. Because I like to follow up the word with the spirit. When the word was given, let there be light. The spirit that had been hovering all of a sudden, boom, gave action to it. Father, right now, I thank you for the anointing on my life, the anointing you put on my life through the things that I've been through, through walking in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. And today I just declare that you are moving in the lives of every person that's watching and listening. I thank you that the wind of God's favor is beginning to blow. I felt it at the nine o'clock. I feel it right now. The wind of your favor, God, is beginning to blow. And as we begin to step out, you're going to come behind us and begin to blow. And the wind of heaven is going to come up under us. And we're going to begin to see that even though we're putting out our best effort, something far beyond our best effort is happening. And Lord, I thank you today. You've given us the key of David. When we open a door, no man will shut it. When we shut a door, no man can open it. I thank you, Lord, today that all discouragement, those who have come in here today frustrated, not feeling like they're moving forward, not feeling like they're attaining what they were created to be, not walking in the fullness of what they feel you've promised them, that today they're finding freedom and they're finding answers in devotion, growth, favor, and process. Lord, I just thank you that every person who's reaching out by faith, whether they're standing, sitting, wherever they are, that today they would leave different than they came. They would leave with a determination. I'm going to begin to walk again. I'm not going to lay down and cause my circumstance to be a graveyard. I'm going to move forward. 
And weeping may go on all night and it may be a long night. But joy, joy, joy is coming in the morning. And it's the darkest time right before the dawn breaks. And today we receive your favor. We receive your faith. We're going to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. We're going to listen to the word and we're not going to listen to the voices of society and television and every naysayer and doubter and blamer. We're going to walk by faith and not by sight. And we're not just coming out of Egypt. We're going into the promised land. We're not just a coming out generation. We're a going in generation. We thank you for it today. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. If you believe it, just give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask you to take your seat for just one more moment because there's something very important that needs to take place. You may be here at the South Campus. You may be there in Baker, Livingston, Mid-City. You're under the sound of my voice right now. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. He's dealing with your heart. He, he's tugging on your heart. No better time than Freedom Weekend to find freedom at the foot of Calvary. And when that hot blood spilled down that rugged cross, freedom was available to us. For the first time, mankind had no, had no availability or opportunity for freedom until the blood of the Lamb was shed. And today you say, I need that blood to cleanse me. You may not even understand what that means or how they implicate. You just know I need God to do something in my life. I came hungry. And with every head bowed, Christians just pray. God is tugging at your heart. If that's you, you say, I need to find freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from shame. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from bondage. If that's you today, I want to pray for you. I want you right there in your seat, wherever you are, just to lift up your hand. Just lift it up. At all of our campuses, our pastors are there. They'll see you. Here at the South Campus, I see your hands. And more importantly, God sees your hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. All over, people are lifting their hands saying, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Maybe you once had that freedom, but you let go of it. You left the light and went back into the darkness. You left the freedom and went back into the shame. And today you come back like the prodigal son and said, I will arise and go back to my father's house. If that's you and you want to come back into the marvelous, marvelous light of the kingdom, I want you to lift your hand right there where you are. Say, pray for me, pastor. Wherever you are, our campus pastors are there. They're also watching. God's watching. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Now, I want to do something, and I want everyone to join in. I want every single person, under the sound of my voice, I want you to put your hand over your heart, and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today, and I'm like Jabez. I have a painful past, but I'm asking you today that you would bless me, that you would expand me, that you would keep me, that you would shine your favor on me. Because today, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my heart. From, the, from this day forward, I am yours and you are mine. I surrender my life at the foot of the cross. I receive your blood. And today, Lord Jesus, I'm a new creation. I'm a new person. My past is erased. My future is yours. Heaven is now my home. I'm a citizen of the kingdom in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.